Hello and welcome to Watercolor. I'm Eldon Fox and I hope this finds you in good health and in good spirits. Um, today's lesson is going to be all about the watercolor wash and I really wanted to start with this because it's such a uh, cornerstone of watercolor, this technique. If you can understand the wash, I think you're well on your way to understanding watercolor as a medium. Um, with that said, I'd like you to keep a little bug in your ear, a little thought in your mind, um, that most of the time in watercolor, when you apply pigment to paper, what you're really doing is applying a wash. And it doesn't matter. You could be using the smallest brush you got, a, a number zero round with just a couple bristles, and you could paint the finest of line possible on that paper. Or you could reach for a one inch mop brush. So really fuzzy brush, holds lots of water, lots of color, and you could cover the whole work surface with that paint. In either case, what you've just done is you've applied a wash. And what I mean by that is that the same principles apply in either case. Uh, you have to remember that in watercolor, the pigment is suspended in water. And it's the interaction of that water with the surface and with the atmosphere around us that dictates where that pigment ends up on the surface, how it dries, what the final appearance is. So I'd just like for you to keep that in your mind uh, for this lesson and going forward that most of the time what we're doing in watercolor is applying a wash. So with that said, let's dive in. So I thought we would start by uh, just going through what a wash actually looks like. And um, so what I've done is if you look here, I've got a couple rectangles here, but keep an eye on this top left one here. And it's, it's just a little area, about two by four inches. And I've drawn a little line down the middle because the left side I've actually pre-moistened with just clear water. And I've allowed that to dry partly. It's still somewhat damp to the touch, but there's no sheen on the surface. So the water's been able to soak in. And uh, then I thought what we would do is what's called a flat wash which basically it's just uh, one color and it's going to be a nice uniform coverage over the area that we're applying the wash. The, uh, it's kind of like uh, what you'd see on, well, if you paint a wall, you're, you're aiming for that, um, that appearance. And today I'm going to actually use uh, the smallest brush in our set, which is the number two round. Uh, normally, you'd want to use the largest brush you have available that you're comfortable using for the given wash. But I wanted to use the smallest one because I want you to get a feel for the process of applying the wash over a larger area. I've gone ahead and I've mixed up a little bit of red paint. It's just red paint and a bit of water. I've mixed up what I think is about twice as much what I think I'll need in the end for the wash. You want to have more paint than you need uh, when you're starting a wash because you don't want to run out halfway through. You don't want to be in the situation where you're, you're scrambling to try and mix more while your wash is drying. We'll get into that. So first of all, I've just I've got as much paint as I think my brush can hold. I'm just going to go up to the top. I'm just going to draw a bead right across the top. I'm actually starting off of where the finished piece would be if this were an actual painting and this were the uh, whole area of the painting. And I'm just charging this bead. So I'm just adding more paint. I want to get this nice and wet. So And I got ahead of myself. There we go. So we we'll want to start with this laying flat. Because we don't want the paint to start moving down the, the surface until we're ready for it to do so. And it's going to take a lot if you're covering a large area. So with this little brush, you see I'm going back several times just trying to build up uh, a nice thick bead of paint. There we go. Let's see if I can get that in the camera for you. So it's pretty thick there. And then we'll go back and we'll get some more paint into the brush. And I've got this little piece of wood here. It's a um, basically a two by four. You want to prop 
your board up on a surface so it's nice and stable. Uh, a couple finger widths high. It doesn't have to be much, but you just want to have it uh, propped up and down towards the direction you're painting. So we'll go back and get a nice healthy amount of paint into our brush. And then we're just going to start working the brush back and forth, going back fairly regularly, picking up more pigment, more paint, just start to work that paint down the surface. And what we're really trying to do, we're not trying to paint the paper, we're moving that bead of water, of paint, down the surface. And we want to add enough paint to keep that bead moving, but not so much that we overwhelm uh, the wash and let it get away from it. If we add too much paint or if we get a little off center, the uh, paint might actually get away, start to run down the surface. So you don't want too steep of an angle and you don't want too much water, but you want to keep this nice and moist. Basically going back to charge it as you feel you need more. And when I say charge, I just mean I'm, I'm adding more pigment or more water to the wash. Or it's, I'll also say sometimes while I'm charging the brush, I'm just getting more water or more paint into the brush. So what you're looking at is a nice, smooth, uh, steady, consistent movement uh, flow to your stroke as you're going back and forth down the surface of the paper. And you want to keep that uh, movement up and you want to keep that steady. You don't really want to stop. Uh, it's really important uh, that once you start a wash, you continue through with it until it's done. And don't worry if you miss a spot, you know, obviously, well, I'll show you. I mean, if I get off course a little bit like that, that's okay. I can go back up. I can pick that up. That's no problem. But if uh, I see something up here, like I see this little moat of dust right here, I'm not going to touch that. Uh, I'll wait till the surface is actually dry and then you can pick it up and it, more likely than not it won't affect the end product. What will affect the end product is if you go up there and you start messing with it because you're going to start disrupting the uh, paint and the pigment and you really want this to be a nice even flow. So we'll just continue on and like I say, I'm adding paint to that bead as I work my way down the surface. I want to keep it nice and wet. Actually, let me show you what happens. We'll just, I got rid of some of that paint. So it's a fairly dry brush. I'm just going to let it get a little more dry. it'll start to get hard to move that paint down the surface. So um, you'll see what's going on, I think, once this dries a little bit. So we'll just bring that back in. You see that line that's appearing on this side? That's because I allowed it to get a little too dry. So it started to fade a little bit and um, then the paint is trying to find equilibrium and it can't. 
there we go. As we get to the bottom of the wash, we'll actually try and refrain from adding too much. I'm just grabbing a little bit. We want to refrain from grabbing too much pigment, too much paint. There we go. But if you do have a little bit of a bead left, let me add that in. Let's say you have that little bead left at the bottom. What you can do is you can go and you can clean out your brush because you don't want that to stay there. And clean it out so it's nice and clean and come over and I just dry that brush a fair amount. It's still wet, but then I just go in and I can pick up that excess paint. Do that again. And what I'm trying to do is I, I want that bottom part of the wash to be the same amount of moisture as further up. So I'm just trying to reduce the height of that bead until it becomes more uniform with the rest of the wash. Because the next step, clean out this brush, as we lift our block up, we remove the support and we lay it flat and we just let the wash dry. Um, we don't want to touch it at this point. If we see any imperfections, we don't want to touch them. Um, the worst thing you can do at this point is go in and try and fix something. Trust me, I've been there. I still do it to this day, but uh, you really want to uh, leave it alone. If nothing else, just get up and walk away. That's probably the best thing you can do at this point. Uh, just get up, walk away, let it dry. So um, one thing I do want to show you, and I think we can get in there with the camera. You'll notice there's a bit of a difference between the two sides. And hopefully, let's see if this camera will pick it. Yeah, there we go. Whoop, let me, uh, and hopefully, let me just point this out. Can you see that the side we pre-moistened is still quite wet, where the other side is actually already starting to dry? Can you see the, the sheen? If you uh, take a look, actually, probably from being, well, we can go from here. Okay. And do you remember where we stopped? And I actually allowed the, um, the, the wash to get a little drier. You see the line that's appeared on the right side, whereas on the left it hasn't? That uh, was intentional. That was not a mistake. I actually intentionally did stop and I, and I did dry out that wash a bit for two reasons. I wanted to show you why it's so important to keep that nice wet bead of paint along the bottom edge and what will happen. I also wanted to show you why we pre-moisten the surface. What that effectively did was create a barrier between our wash and the paper and it slowed down the rate of absorption of the water into the paper and it allowed the pigment in that wash to remain suspended above the surface and in doing so it's giving the pigment time to blend with the previous and subsequent strokes so we end up with this nice uniform appearance whereas on the right hand side because that water from the wash soaks in a lot faster that pigment basically sits down onto the surface and it's just not going to move. So that's how we end up with this line on the right hand side whereas on the left hand side it's just a far more uniform appearance. So that's why I pre-moistened it and, and I just wanted you to see what the difference was. So if you've tried watercolor before and you've ended up with these lines, uh, in the future you'll want to try uh, just pre-moisten the surface and I think you'll have far better success. Now, you know, I think we can take an even closer look at what's going on here. Why don't you come with me? So here we have a close-up view of our watercolor drop, and this is what that bead of paint we started our wash with would actually look like from the side. 
Now it doesn't look like it's doing very much, but there's a lot going on inside that drop. The individual water molecules, what we call H2O, are actually moving around. And as they move, they're actually pulling and pushing the individual particles of our pigment along with them. And some of those water molecules are actually moving fast enough that they escape from our watercolor drop into the atmosphere around us. And as you probably already know, we call that evaporation. Well, as that water is evaporating, the edges start to dry up and our watercolor drop starts to get smaller, while at the same time those pesky escaping water molecules are actually moving the individual particles of our pigment towards the drying edge, where they get trapped and they pile up on one another. And that's what can cause those lines to appear in our wash if we don't keep that wash moving and maintaining that wet edge. Now once we've established that bead of paint along the top, we actually tilted our work surface, which is what we've done here with our watercolor drop. Can you see how when we tilted the surface, the shape of the drop changes? Water is always looking for level. So when we tilt our surface, that watercolor drop is going to change its shape to keep the top of the drop level or parallel with the horizon. Well, in doing so, it actually shifts more of the paint towards the direction of the wash, which helps to keep more of the pigment in suspension above the paper longer. And this helps us maintain that wet edge and get a more uniform wash. Now watch what happens when we bring our big old brush in and we start to move the edge down the surface of the paper. As we move that wet edge of the bead down the surface of the paper, the bead is actually going to follow along as it seeks to remain level. See how the top of the bead actually steps down the surface of the paper as we advance that wet edge? And the back of the bead actually starts to form our wash. This is why I said to think of it not as trying to paint the surface, but guiding the bead. Because as we guide that bead down the surface of our paper, the bead is actually going to do our painting for us. Now, as we reach the end of our wash, we're actually going to want to start reducing the size of that bead. That bead has done its job, but if we left it the bottom of the wash, that area would have a greater concentration of pigment and we'd lose the uniformity of the wash. But more importantly, if we have that bead at the bottom of our wash, when we lay the surface down flat to dry, that bead is actually gonna travel back up our wash and disturb the paint that we've laid down. And we'll end up with blooms in our wash. So once we've reached the bottom of the wash, the last thing we'll wanna do is just take our brush to pull up any excess paint from that bead so it's uniform in coverage and we'll just lay that surface down and let our wash dry. So with those uh, elements to a successful wash in mind, let's go ahead and we'll um, do what's called a gradient wash. So I've already mixed up some color and it's just blue, uh, uh, straight blue. And then I did uh, kind of a, a mid tone um, for the uh, middle of the gradient. You'll see uh, how that works in a minute. But yeah, we'll just start with, um, oh, and I've already uh, pre-moistened the surface. So we'll just start with our establishing the bead at the top. And we're just going to charge that bead. There we go. And you want to try and get them a nice level surface to work on. Um, as far as the table is concerned, this will help out a lot too. There we go. So just charge that. Bring in our little piece of board. And then we're just going to start moving that down the surface. Nice, smooth, consistent strokes. Going back for more paint as we need it. And I'm just going to use 
that straight blue, this uh, first uh, mixture here, a nice dark blue. I'm going to use that for about, oh, the first fifth of this wash. So it starts out just the same as our flat wash. Nice even strokes. Just keep that wet edge moving. Okay, then I'm going to charge the brush again. Just get a nice established bead there. Okay, I'm going to go over to this um, thinner mixture here. And at first, you're not going to notice any difference. There we go. But we've basically reduced the amount of pigment in the wash. And I charged the brush with uh, our uh, deeper uh, blue here. So that's still sitting in the brush when we start uh, the transition. And that's going to make its way into the bead. There we go. We've got a little bit of a bump there. So just by pressing down, I can move that water around. Our paint um, our paint is fluid, and what I mean by that is, um, you know, where the pigment is at the moment isn't where it's going to end up in the end. We can still decide where we want that paint to be. There we go. Remember, we're just guiding that bead, we're guiding that paint, we're moving that pigment. Down the wash. A little dry spot right there. You can go back up and touch a little spot, but you want to be really if it's close to where you're at, at the, in the process of the wash. I wouldn't go back up here at this point, but that little spot was a little dry, and I didn't uh, worry it, so I just touched it and I moved on. Basically, just creating a path for the paint, the pigment to move in because that was a dry spot. Okay. So we're just going back and get more. Pretty soon I'm going to start, I'm going to grab the, uh, right over here I've got some, just some clear water. In fact, I'll do one more, getting really close about just over a third down the wash. I'm going to start transitioning into that clear. And I still have the uh, paint that was in the brush and that's going to move out into the, the bead. But you can see that the basic concept is the same as when we were doing the flat wash. The same mechanics are there. We're still just adding paint to the bead, it's just the paint is changing. So we'll just finish it up, and as we get to the bottom, we're just I'm not going to go back for any more uh, water at this point, any more paint. I'm just going to get it back to the edge, and I'm happy with that. So I'll just lay that down flat and let it dry. 
So this next wash can be one of the more challenging ones for people. And it's called a, a variegated wash, which means we just have multiple colors. So in this one, we're transitioning. So from our blue that we had before, we're going to be transitioning into yellow. And uh, the uh, secondary color between uh, the two primaries, which is blue and yellow, is green. So I've mixed that up and you'll see that it's not a uh, full mix and I'm going to use that transition in the wash itself. So, uh, so let's get started with that. Again, I've pre-moistened and again I'm going to start with the blue. And we're just going to be starting on working on this one right here. So we'll just define that bead, get it nicely charged. And you'll see the paper will buckle a little bit and that will actually move the pigment around. So you just want to keep that in mind. If it gets really bad, you can kind of press down a little bit. Again, it's paper, so it's going to swell a little bit, especially when we pre-moisten it. Okay, so that's a nice charge right there. So again, we'll just, it's the same mechanics as before. We're just going to move that up on, on our little board and we'll start to move that bead down the paper just as before. And just as before, I'm gonna work about a fifth of the way down just with this solid color, just to establish it. And I say a fifth of the way down, but you'll find as you paint, you'll want a different transition. So you might want to start it earlier or later, and that's fine. This is just the basic mechanics that we're covering here. and giving you the tools that you can go forth and make your own art. The key to a successful wash is a nice, even stroke. I'm going to start moving in. I'm going to start in the blue section of this center panel here. Just going to start to bring in that green. And this one you'll see, oh, I was going to say you'll see a more obvious transition, but I think I did that one. Yeah, it's starting to show up. So I'll just move into the green some more. Okay, so it starts out with a bit of a turquoise. But you want a nice, even, steady flow to your wash. Don't let your nerves get the best of you. There's a, uh, for me sometimes I, it can get a little nerve wracking. Because with a wash you're really setting up for it. but Try not to let it get to you. You want to be smooth and confident with your strokes. There we go. Got a little bit of a bleed right there. It's a bit too wet up there. Okay. More into the green. I'm actually going to angle it ever so slightly because I've got a bow in the middle here. You want to keep a nice, even stroke. Maintain that wet edge. I keep talking about the wet edge because I think that's one of the really important ones here. The other thing is um, to not move back up into the area you've already covered. Because more likely than not, if you touch that area, you'll make it worse. <laughs> I'm just going to start to bring in a bit more of that yellow as I get towards the center. There we go. And we just want to keep that wet edge moving. And I'm just moving from the blue over to the yellow in the center panel here of our palette. There 
There we go. And if you're not getting the same results, well, actually, you won't get the same results. And it's important to remember, especially when you're starting out, you're learning. So just tr concentrate on the mechanics rather than uh, trying to worry about matching what I have. Something else with any kind of a transitional wash or a gradient wash is you don't want to move back up the scale. So if you were to go back up to the blue at this moment to try and tweak the color a little bit, you're more likely to get a line of blue in this case, and you probably don't want that because it is a gradient. Okay, now this is just a plain yellow over here, and I'm gonna start pulling in some of that. You can see as I touch it, um, the uh, pigment from the brush is actually uh, coloring this right here, which is why I mixed up a, a yellow here rather than just grabbing from the palette, uh, the cup right here, so. And we're gonna start adding in the yellow. There we go. And I start about, oh, two thirds down this. There we go. And you'll notice I'm at an angle here. That's because I had a little issue with it pooling on the left here. So um, by angling it a little bit, it encourages that bead to be more uh, uniform across the whole of the wet edge. So that's what I'm doing there. It's not very much, but it's just enough. Because you can kind of see where it started to bleed down right in there. And again, that was just to counteract the fact that the paper bows a little bit. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and clean out my brush. I'm gonna grab a little bit of the straight yellow in this case. Just bring that over. And I'm mixing across from where I was grabbing the paint before. So again, just moving down the palette. And we'll just finish off this wash. Pick that up. There we go. There we go. And there we go. I've got a little tiny bit of a bead, so I'm going to dry out my brush. Got that all dried out. And it's still moist, obviously, but just going to go in and just pick up. There's a slight bead that I don't want when I lay this down to dry. There we go. And you can use the light to see. And you want just a uniform, uh, a, a uniform appearance to the surface. So, and again, we'll just lay that down to dry. So for this last one, I've gone ahead and I've done a gradient wash uh, from yellow up to clear. And I've, uh, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to set up another gradient wash. So we're just going to be doing one wash over the other. And we're going to be using our blue again. And I'm just going to do a blue gradient wash from the top down over the yellow. I want you to see what happens. Just gonna grab a bit more blue. We've been using that blue. So again, we're just establishing the bead. There we go. Okay. We're putting it up on the surf on our little board here. Go back for some more blue. And again, we're just going to move that and 
draw that wet edge down the surface. Nice even strokes. Keep that wet edge moving. about a fifth of the way down and we'll just start to bring in our lighter shade of blue Nice and even. And we'll just continue down the board, slowly transitioning that gradient to clear. I've got a little build up in the corners. So I'm just pulling that down a bit go back over. I want to make sure I don't get too much water. You can get too much paint on the surface into that bead. You want just enough that you can control it. Down we go. Nice and gentle. Just keeping it nice and smooth. This is the real power of that translucent quality to watercolor, is being able to have those multiple washes, multiple layers. I'm going to switch over and clean out my brush. Just going to grab that clear. And even though I'm basically done, let me pull out a little bit more of that. I'm almost just to clear water at this point, but even so, I want to continue that wash down the entirety of the surface. Oops, grabbed the wrong color there. Okay, because if we were to just stop now, when it dried, we'd actually end up with a little line. So even though it's just clear at this point, we want to continue that down. Because as you recall, as the water dries, any pigment moves to the edge and that, that'll form the line. Okay. Just checking to make sure, okay, I don't have any bead at the bottom at that point. So we're just gonna let that dry and then we'll be back. So I've given the washes some time to dry and I wanted to go over uh, what we did with those last three washes because it felt a bit rushed. To be honest, I was running out of space on the cameras and instead of taking care of that, I continued on and that was my mistake. Um, so I just wanted to go over what we did with the other three washes here. The first one, or rather I should say the second one is this gradient wash. And it's just like the flat wash. The only difference is that you're changing the amount of pigment in your mixture as you move down 
the wash. So you're still maintaining that bead, but the composition of the bead changes. And I hope that's uh, apparent to you. Um, then when you go over to the variegated wash, it's just like the gradient wash, only instead of reducing the amount of pigment in the bead, you're replacing one pigment for another. And uh, so you get a transition from, in this case, blue to yellow as you work through the green. And now over here, some people have trouble uh, with the variegated wash. And I found when I was having trouble with it that what I could do is use two gradient washes in opposition to one another. So I'd work, uh, in this case, I worked with the yellow from the bottom up and then I let that dry and then I worked with the blue from the top down and you get a similar result. Um, they would have been even closer, but I made a mistake. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I just want you to take this away that each wash is basically the same. Uh, it, the the uh, mechanics are the same. And um, with that said, I, I would like to get into, well, I don't want to, my pride doesn't want me to, but um, I think it's important to get into what went wrong. So uh, first, with the variegated wash, I made a very simple mistake. Um, I grabbed the wrong mixture and I didn't notice it at the time. Had I noticed it at the time, if it was still close to the bead, I could have gone back in uh, with a, a moist brush and just uh, slightly dry and just use that to pick up the pigment. Just like you do at the bottom uh, uh, when you're at the end of your wash, uh, you can use that uh, dry brush to, to pull up the excess uh, moisture from the bead. You can do the same thing with a wet paint. You need to be careful with that because um, you're going to disrupt things and you're likely to get a line, but it's possible to recover at that point. Um, with this one, <laughs> I didn't uh, account for the fact, I, to be honest, I'm used to working with a uh, better material. So while this is a good uh, place to start, it, this paper doesn't um, respond the same as I'm used to. It buckles more, it can't hold as much water. And I was cognizant of it up here with this first wash, but I'd forgotten down here. I, again, I was feeling rushed and I didn't stop to let it dry, and that's what I should have done. Um, and there was just too much of a bulge. And you remember I was pushing down on it at one point. Um, I should have stopped and I should have let that dry more, but I didn't. That was one issue. The other issue was um, as I was working down, I got the bead too wet. I got too much moisture in that bead and it started to move back up the page and I didn't catch it in time. Um, again, it would have been simple enough to just pull out some of that moisture, and that's what I should have done. And I think when I left it to dry, I left it a bit too wet. This one was just wet. And remember, when uh, your uh, watercolor is still wet, that pigment is still moving around, and that's what happened here. So it, the, it just basically it pushed that pigment out of the way, and that's why it's a little faded here as well, whereas this is a bit brighter. So, um, these aren't lost. I could fix them, and to be honest, I've been trying to decide whether or not to show you how to fix them, or um, I could show you how to fix them, but I'm reluctant to at this point because I don't think it's important. Um, we're still learning. <laughs> and I think it's far more important. You see this, all this other paper over here. I left this open because I want you after this lesson to come over here, make more uh, rectangles or whatever shapes you want. And I want you to practice. And I want you to practice the mechanics. You're going to make mistakes. And I don't want you to get caught up with this idea of trying to fix the mistakes. I want you to understand why they happened and then um, try again. Uh, 
practice for perfection, but accept the reality of life. And the reality of life is that no one's perfect. And I think with that in mind, um, I've, <laughs> I think I've finally decided, I'm gonna show you how to roll with it. So we've got this one, and what I could do is I could lift out this paint very carefully, and I might make it better, I might make it worse. This one would be a simple case if I could just go over with another wash of blue. And that would be, it would still be there, but it would be really masked. If I were to try and fix this, uh, I would make it worse. But instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, let me open up my water. I've done enough talking. Let's do some fun stuff. <laughs> um, I was looking at these and I thought, you know, this one would make for that, that line would make a really good uh, horizon for a seascape. And this one would make a really good cloud, a start to a cloud, or it would make for a good tree. So with that in mind, I'm just gonna show you what I would do with these two errors. So I've still got some blue over here. And I think for this one, I'm just gonna grab some of this green. I'm just gonna cheat. I'm going to grab a little bit of the violet, get a nice dark color, because this is kind of a gloomy seascape is what I'm thinking. So, and we'll just go in, and I'm thinking we'll just do a quick... This is the bravery test. <laughs> I'm gonna put an old boat in here. Kind of off to the side there. Clean out the brush. I'm just gonna pick up just a smidge of paint. And go up here and right there's the mast or one of the masts, I think. We'll see. And then we're gonna have a yard arm right there, and another one right there. Maybe we got some sail coming down, some rigging, and drops in. There we go. And actually, let's make this a, let's make this a, an old sailing ship. So we'll bring up that, was that the aft castle? I don't remember the terminology. But anyways, there we go. Maybe we have got a little cannon sticking out the side. Then this ship has seen better days. And maybe it's gone aground a bit. Maybe there's a, a shallow area and that's why it's sitting the way it is. And we've got another mast forward of the other one, and it's broken off. We'll bring up the sails a bit here. And actually, we can lift out some of that. So just clean the brush. And I'm just gonna put this up here real quick. I'm just going to leave it there to sit for a moment. Clean out that brush again. Get it fairly dry. Actually, my hand might be a bit wet, so I'm going to cover up that other um, wash there so I don't ruin that. And I'm just lifting out a little bit of the paint. I don't want to pull it all out. I just want to give the indication that there's some um, canvas there, some light canvas. There we go. And I've got a clean brush here, and I'm just going to go down here. I want to smooth out that those uh, water ripples. There we go. And let's grab a little bit of that green. I want a lighter color. There we 
go. And remember, since the watercolor is translucent, ooh, that's neat. Um, the uh, blue I put down is going to look a little more green because of the yellow background. Uh, I think it's important with uh, painting, any kind of painting, it doesn't even have to be watercolor, or, or really anything. Um, the painting you start out with the intention of making isn't always the painting you end up with. In fact, it's rarely the case. Um, and oftentimes, the uh, irregularity, the imperfection, is what can make uh, a piece of art. And it's important to embrace that. So. Okay. There we go. And we'll have a little remnant of a of a flag or something right there. And you can go in and take more time and and uh, add a bunch of lines and whatnot. There we go. Just want you to see, so that's something you can do. We can say, okay, well, that's what that wash looks like. <laughs> and now we'll just go over here. Um, I want to grab a little bit more of that violet color. And, well, first of hmm. Yeah. I'm going to grab our number four. Am I? Yeah, okay. Always good to stop and think about what you're going to do next. <laughs> If you have any doubt, stop and give it a thought. But I'm going to... Let's see, don't want that too wet. I'm just going to bring out a little bit of this. This is what's called a bloom. This is when you get a, a basically a, a, the, a pigment or, wolf, or just clear water when it runs back up into an area. And it, basically it pushes your pigment out of the way. And it can be a really neat effect when you want it, or it can be really frustrating when you don't. <laughs> okay, and I'm just using a dry, clean paper towel. And I'm just pulling up a little bit. And again, that's what we could have done over here, is just lightly... You don't want to scrub it, uh, especially since this is paper. Um, if you scrub it, it's going to pill, and you don't want that to happen. So this is a good paper to get started with, but you will learn its limitations. And uh, definitely one of its limitations is it's not a hardy uh, surface, so you can't really scrub it like you can others. Um, more professional grade. You get a nice heavy cotton paper. Um, then it, it can put up with a lot more abuse. So, but this is a good place to get started. Okay, I don't want to get too carried away with that. And back to our number two, into that darker mixture we got. And make sure, I'm just gonna do a quick, I don't want any bleeding, so. And I think we're going to have a tree right there. It's a nice big tall tree. When I saw this, I said, ah, crap. But then I said, oh, that would make for a neat tree. And I'm actually playing around. It would also make for a good cloud and I couldn't decide, so I'm gonna do both. So it's gonna be a tree with a cloud canopy. And when you're doing uh, branches, some people find it easier to start from the bottom and then work 
to a thinner point. And you can do it, uh, and that's a perfectly good way to do it. I tend to have trouble with it. So what I tend to do is I work from a fine point down to a thicker one. In fact, these are so fine you may not even be able to see some of this. But anyways, so we'll go down here and we'll give it a little foot. Right there. And we'll give it, um, <laughs> yeah, right there. And I think, let me get a slightly thinner. There we go. We'll just put a little shadow right there. I'm gonna clean out the brush. And we'll just thin that out. There we go. Move that down there, okay. And I think, since it's kind of a grassland, actually, hmm, do I wanna do, yeah, okay. It's a bit of a grassland, so we'll just, oh, actually, before I do that, we'll grab our number four again, go into that clear, and this is a neat trick. So I'm just doing a, a really light wash. It's uh, really light, just ever so gently. Clean out that brush. And I'm going to pull some of that darker color. There we go. It needs a little bit more. It's almost too dry. I, I want it to move. There we go. Yeah. There we go. Just little tufts of grass. water there. This is a bit of a dance. I wasn't going to do this. This is what's called wet and wet, which I haven't touched on yet. Um, some people, well, a lot of uh, people consider wet on wet to be a wash. I think it's a separate technique in of itself. So while a lot of people cover wet and wet with the other washes, I, I'm going to be covering it as a separate, um, separate lesson. And so this is just a little taste of what the wet and wet looks like. This is one of the things you can do. And it's, it's really, it's a dance with the pigment. Um, this is when you really have to uh, bring the philosophy of watercolor uh, to the forefront of your mind. And, and it's basically just, uh, that you're guiding the paint. So you're working with the dynamics of water and pigment rather than fighting it. So if you fight it, it'll fight back and you don't want to do that. So, so that's just a little touch. I don't want to get too, too far into it, but there we go. So there's a lot you can do uh, with the mistakes. Uh, as Bob Ross said, we don't make mistakes, we, we only have happy accidents. And uh, this is really a case in that. So um, I think these look pretty neat. And I think it's just an example of what you can do when your painting goes a different direction than what you were anticipating. So with that, uh, next lesson is going to be a landscape, and we're going to be using a lot of what we've learned with the washes to uh, uh, execute that landscape. So with that, I hope this video finds you well and in good health, and I'll see you next time. Goodbye. <laughs>